listen, today I just want to welcome you again to Talk in Church, a time when we just gather together um, during the week just to set our minds on the things of God, consider church, consider our mandate, consider the things that the Lord has for us and wants us to do. And I want to continue today just with a thought that was on my mind when I woke up this morning. And that thought was simply about really being disciplined in this time of lockdown, in this time of unprecedented, in this time of unusual, to secure your mind. I know we spoke a little bit last week on uh, setting your mind on things above, but just when I awoke this morning, again, I just had this thought to encourage you today to be securing your mind because your mind is the thought processor of your life. And if you don't secure your mind, you can enable it or allow it to be processing thoughts that have no good thing in them. Meanwhile, ignoring thoughts that do. So I want to concentrate a little bit again today, a bit of a follow on from last week, really, on securing your mind. I want to read from Isaiah or Isaiah, whichever country you're you're watching from. Isaiah 26 verse 3 has got a great statement about the mind and having a security in our minds or a stability in our minds. <clears throat> it simply says this, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast or stayed or set on you because he trusts you. Isn't that a lovely verse? A nice verse to start our Tuesday with. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is steadfast, stayed or set, can be any of those words, on you because he trusts you. I really believe that God wants us to know perfect peace in our daytimes and in our night times. But a lot of the times what can affect us having perfect peace is the thoughts that we're allowing into our mind and how we're processing them. It's amazing that the thoughts that are in my mind when I go to sleep can really affect my sleep. They can affect my dreams. They can affect my rest. But also the thoughts that are in my mind when I wake up in the morning. I've learned over the years that you've almost got to seize those thoughts and say, no, okay, this is what my thoughts are going to be today. Thoughts are amazing things. They contain a lot of potential for good or evil, for, for bad or good. You know, there's certain times when we think a lot. For me, whenever I'm decorating... Um, if I go to decorate a room, whoever's on my mind, who, whoever's in my thoughts when I start decorating that room, um, stay with me for the whole project, which is normally more than 24 hours when I'm decorating a room. And it's amazing sometimes when, you know, someone's done you a bit of wrong or something and you've got a thought in your mind about a person. It's like you can let them cook or marinate in your mind and it produces no good thing. But On the contrary, if you've got a good thought about someone like, ah, what a blessing that person is, or how can I do that person good? That thought can remain with you during the project that you're doing. And again, the thought never remains just a thought, does it? It always turns into something. That's why I believe that the Bible encourages us today in Isaiah, that God will keep us in perfect peace, whose minds are steadfast and set on him. So I want to encourage you today to have a set mind. You know, last week we were talking from Colossians, the advice of Colossians, where it says, set your mind, you know, um, establish your mind on things above. Set your heart on heavenly things and not on earthly things. But today, I love the um, the thought of having a, a girded up mind. And Peter picks up this thought of a girded up mind in uh, the book of First Peter, chapter 1 verses 13 to 16. So we've looked last week at set your mind, set your mind on things above, set your mind in the direction of the things that God has for you. But today I want to look at a girded mind or a girded up mind. And uh, just reading from 1 Peter chapter 1, picking up in verse 13. It says this, and I'm reading from the NIV. It says, therefore, prepare your minds or gird up the mind, um, you know, uh, uh, gird up your thinking um, for, uh, excuse me, I lost my place. Therefore, gird up the loin of your mind, be self-controlled, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, 
But just as he who called you is holy, now be holy in all you do. It says, be holy because I am holy. Now, I love the translation. I think it's the King James Version that says, gird up the loin of your mind. That's, that's strange terminology, isn't it? We don't really use that terminology. But they did use that terminology in the first century or when, when the Bible was written. And to gird up had a number of me, uh, meanings. One of the meanings was it was like um, to gather up or to get the stuff that's loose. And the comparison there that's often given is like a Roman soldier that would gird up um, with a belt and he would, when he needed to run or he needed to, um, to, to be going somewhere quickly, he would gather up all the loose edges of garments and gird them up um, within a belt. Why? So then he was free to run without being tripped up. It's amazing that when we don't gird up our mind or take control of our thoughts or secure our mind, or have some say or control over what we're thinking. Things can go in all manner of directions, can't they? But when we take time to put a bell on our mind and say, no, I'm going to allow this thought, I'm not going to allow this thought, this thought's running away with itself. What we're doing is we're girding up, um, we're taking control, we're taking authority, we're taking responsibility for the thought life that happens within the mind of who we are. But another way of looking at the first century thought of girding up the loin of your mind was back in the first century, loins were really considered the centre of uh, procreative power, where things were born, things were conceived and things came from. So you had the one context of gathering up loose stuff that could trip you up or cause you injury and then you had the other thought which was more of a first century thought concerning girding up the loin of your mind but the loin was always something to do with procreative uh, power or ability the ability to reproduce the ability to bring things into being and I really believe that that's what Paul is talking about when he says that we want to live in the perfect peace of God we want to know the perfect peace of God, just not when just things are good, but also when things are challenging. But the way that we know the peace of God or maintain or secure the peace of God in our lives is from having a discipline in our world that we know how to gird up the, produ- the, the procreative or productive ability of our processor, our mind. And again, your mind is like a processor. That, that's the basic um, example of what our minds are. In fact, any processor that's been made by man was modelled on the mind of man. And there's not a processor around today, I believe, that can equal the, the mind of a person, its ability to see, comprehend, perceive, reason, categorise. In so many ways, our minds are like hard drives, aren't they, of the computer of our life. What we put into our mind can cause our mind to begin to process, process, process and reach conclusions. Now, we want to make sure that the data or the data that's coming in to our mind is data that is worthy of being uh, processed. Sometimes, you know, there's an old expression, garbage in, garbage out, rubbish in, rubbish out. The bottom line is whatever you put into your mind, your mind, because God designed it this way without getting too complicated, to process things and specifically to process thoughts. That's why the Bible says he'll keep in perfect peace those whose minds are stayed or set steadfast on him. Uh, those who have decided that they're going to trust him. But also that, that in, in Peter, sorry, not Paul, Peter encourages us to gird up the loin of our mind. Understand that your mind has incredible ability to process, to produce, to germinate, to, to incubate certain things that start in the form of a thought but can turn into big oak trees in our world. And I'm going to dig into that a little bit this morning to encourage you, because we're really in a time where 
There's thoughts flying everywhere. There's thoughts on the media. There's thoughts on the news. There's, there's thoughts from the medical, uh, the World Health Organization. There's thoughts from the Chancellor of the Exchequer. There's thoughts from the World Bank. There's thoughts from the Bank of England. There's thoughts from the uh, Conservatives, from, from, from Labour, from Democrats, from Republicans. There's thoughts from, from uh, spiritual people that are cool and spiritual people that are weird. There's thoughts everywhere. And God has designed our minds to be uh, like processors that take thoughts, take the data or the data of a thought that we've experienced or encountered and then bring it to some form of resolve. I don't know about you. Have you ever had one of those thoughts that really didn't have an answer? And it's like your head went into like a pinball machine into tilt. Because just like a computer will jam, if there's no real answer to data that's being put in. So it's like our minds sometimes. People live in something that's different to the peace of God because they're allowing confusing data or things that are just not based on the word of God to be coming into their mind, the processor that God gave them in their life. And and it's not making sense. It's not making sense. So they begin to almost jam or go into tilt like a pinball machine. Now, we've got to protect our minds. That's why the Bible speaks of the armour of God, that we put on the helmet of salvation. We've got to understand the power of this mind, this processor that God's given us. Uh, power to do great things. Power to conceive and produce remember the mind is and the girding up of a line the mind when peter spoke of it was of, of, of a procreative ability things are born in your thinking and again that's either good or bad um either positive or negative so your mind which is like a processor it turns thoughts or it desires to turn thoughts into conclusions um, just like your computer designed, is designed to take data and conclude things or come up with an answer. So that's how God designed your, what, your mind. And every computer is based on the mind that God designed. And this is just a crude an, 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 an analogy of this. There's some great books out there by Dr. Caroline Leaf and uh, the classic Battlefield of a Mind by Joyce Mayer. But speak of the creative battlefield or, or creative place of our thinking. But just to bring it in a crude example or a very blunt or, or, or very uh, layman's terms, your mind is a processor that takes thoughts and longs to bring them to conclusion. It establishes truth. It's where your belief system is thorns, uh, formed. Uh, truths or, or thoughts and philosophies enter your mind. And as you process them, conclude them, suddenly they then establish the belief system of your life, which is what you live true to when you're thinking about it and when you don't. You know, a lot of our behavior comes from just stuff that we believe deep down in the subconscious of who we are. Now, that's brilliant if those thoughts are based on things that are true, based on the word of God. But if there's deep seated thinking, there's error or 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 rubbish that you've allowed in your mind, maybe of who you are, your worth, your potential, and certain things. The thing is, your mind is continuing chewing over that wrong data and bringing those conclusions which are forming your belief systems. And your belief systems determine what you see in the mirror. Your, your belief systems can determine what you think you're worth. It's amazing when you deal with somebody that's experienced abuse or been in an abusive relationship for any amount of time. In that time of being in that abuse, certain thought patterns were established, ruts were set in the thinking of what a person's worth or what they deserved was. And once you've dug a rut, it's sometimes hard to get out the rut, but not with God involved. God can fill every rut and bring new ones, new directions within your thinking. But you've got to understand that you have a responsibility. You're a gate man or a gate woman at the, at the, at the gates of your mind. You've got to You've got to not let anything wander on in whenever it wants, but you've got to begin to say, no, I'm going to gird up the loin, the procreative, the, um, the, the producing ability of my mind to be producing things that do me and others good, not harm. It's amazing that your mind 
can really set direction. Have you ever had one of those moments where you just had a random thought and um, you didn't deal with the thought and it stayed with you? It's like it then germinated and began to find life expression within you. And it's amazing that by the end of the day, your life has gone in the direction of that thought. Now, that can be as simple as um, a chocolate eclair. You can have that random thought. Oh, I just need a chocolate eclair. Or for me, uh, oh, a chicken tikka masala. Sitting there, not wondering, wondering about chicken tikka masala. All of a sudden, I'm just using this as an example, a thought can come in. Oh, it's been a long, long time since you've had a good chicken tikka masala. Yeah, you know that place down the street, that does a good one. And that thought comes and you're like, Mm, that's a good thought. That's a tasty thought. And you begin to think, well, chicken tikka masala. Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe that would be nice. Um, yeah, I haven't had a curry for a while. Yeah, oh, yeah, remember that good one that I had? And suddenly what you're doing, you see, is you're taking a thought that's come in singular, just a, a, a thought among many thoughts in any day, and you're allowing it to conceive, to germinate, to breed, and to produce within you that pretty much for me, means at seven o'clock I am going to be uh, ringing Deliveroo or Uber Eats or someone to get a curry to the house. Now the whole journey of mobilising a person to cook a curry for me, mobilising somebody to deliver it, all started with a singular thought that I had in the midst of many thoughts, wouldn't a curry be nice? Now I know that's a, a real simple example but think how many times in a day that you're doing that with thoughts that are beneficial to your life and to others, but also with thoughts that aren't beneficial to you. And that's why the Bible really tells us to, to really understand that the mind can be a battlefield. Excuse me while I have a swig. The, the mind can be a very real battlefield and it sets direction. Um, I've heard it said once, and we'll probably say this a few times today, but you will always go in the direction of your dominant thought. The thing that you're thinking on the most will always determine the direction of your life. And that, again, as with all the things that we're looking at today, can be both negative and positive. It's like if you set your mind on faith, you'll go in the direction of trusting God. Remember the promise in Isaiah 26 verse 3 that we have perfect peace because we set our minds on him and we trust him. What is it to trust God? To place your faith in your belief. In God, that his promises are yes and amen towards you. His um, providence is yes and amen towards you. But if you set your mind not on faith, on trusting God, but on fear, it's amazing. Just like Job said, that which he greatly feared came upon him. It's like that you can set a direction for your life um, by just, just saying, oh, no, no, I'm scared this is going to happen. And you've got no evidence. Remember, fear is fake evidence appearing real, F-E-A-R, fake evidence appearing real. But it's, ama it's amazing, especially in the nighttime hour, when a thought comes that's got the DNA of fear in it and it's not dealt with quickly, it can so easily embed and begin to send out its little tentacles and begin to establish very real concerns within us. Yet when we sit down and we talk with someone, especially a godly person, we suddenly go, that's ridiculous, isn't it? That's not going to happen. I've got no evidence of that happening. All of this fear now within me came from a thought that I didn't govern, I didn't take control of. Now, it was often said that it takes the same amount of energy to have faith as it does to have fear, or to have fear as it does to have faith. It's where we choose to set our mind or what we allow the processor of our mind, which God designed. Your mind is not evil. Your mind is a major part of that third of you called your soul. Remember what we've been sharing over the last few weeks, but you know, you are a spirit, you have a soul and you live in a body. Now, all three parts, all three thirds are very important. God loves all three thirds, especially when the soul is under the leadership and the authority of the spirit. Left to itself, a soul oh my goodness, can get you into trouble. But when it's under the authority of the Spirit, when you're causing your soul to walk in step with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit then actually flows through or filters through your soul and does incredible things using your personality, your loves, your hates, and all that good stuff that, that makes you you within the soul of who you are. But we need to understand that when thoughts come in, 
if we don't govern those thoughts, our mind has the, the ability to be procreative. Um, that's why, again, again, let me keep saying, First Peter, it says, gird up the loin of your mind. If you've got loose stuff hanging around you, well, I don't know what I think about this. No, no, get a belt, gird it up, bring it in, gather it. Make sure there's no loose stuff in your thinking that the enemy could use for harm in your life. But also remember, your mind is, is procreative. The thoughts that come into your mind have the ability to grow. Now, the good news is that's positive as well as negative. That's good as well as bad. <clears throat> so what is your mind? If we've established that our mind is like the hard drive of our life, it's or the processor of our life, then we understand what does it process? It processes thoughts, not some thoughts or thoughts. It determines your belief system. All of these things come from what's occurring in your mind when you're not actually conscious most of the time that things are happening. Now, I don't know how they judge this, but um, some experts have said that on average, a person will think well over 6,000 thoughts every day. Now, think about that. You're not sitting there going, I just had a thought. Well, some people probably are, but the majority of people aren't shocked when they get a thought. Now, some people that don't really think much probably go, oh, wow, that was a thought. Now, I get shocked by certain thoughts that come in, both good and bad, but I'm sometimes not aware but I'm constantly thinking the processor of my mind is constant, constantly wanting to be procreative. Um, it wants to be germinating thoughts that are coming in. And as you know, um, thoughts are interesting things, aren't they? Thoughts can be like an old Western spaghetti movie, good, bad or ugly. They can they can be good. They can be good thoughts. That's a good thought. That's why Paul says that we're to have almost a, th a filter on our thoughts. Whatever's good, whatever's pure, whatever's noble. Um, think on these things, whatever's of good report. Remember that, that almost like that, that sheet um, that we're to hold our thoughts next to that Paul provides when he says, whatever's good, whatever's pure, whatever's ever noble, whatever, you know, whatever's beautiful, whatever's nice, think on these things, which means there must be a corresponding list of things that are ugly, bad, evil, wicked, lustful, hurtful to others, that we need to be guards at the door of our mind saying those thoughts aren't coming in. I don't even want my mind to waste a second processing junk. That's again why we've got to protect the gates of our life. It's been said many times that, you know, your eyes are gates, your ears are gates. And again, you can um, suddenly open your eyes and your ears as gates to thoughts on media, on TV, on Netflix. Now, I'm sure you've been amazed with me how the standards on movies is dropping, 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 dropping. You know, it wasn't so long ago that if you watched a 15 movie, you're pretty good not to hear too much language or any language. You wouldn't see any um, sex scenes or anything like that. But these days, oh my goodness, I don't know what's going on with how they age or put an age on movies or series on Netflix and on films. Because you could be in the middle of a movie and the language is popping out. And again, those language, those thoughts that you're listening to are coming into your mind. They're coming into your processor. Things that you're seeing um, scenes can create thoughts within you. But if you don't gird up the loin of your mind and say, no, no, that's not the life God's got for me. They can suddenly come in unnoticed and embed themselves in your processing and be producing directions in your life that you never wanted to go into. Now, you know, it's the power of a thought is such a dangerous thing. It's an incredible thing when it comes to God, because one thought can give you a whole new direction for your life. But also in the negative, one thought can cause destruction in your life. And that's why we've got to be securing our mind, girding up our minds, taking personal responsibility for our mind, because a lot of the time the thoughts are coming into our mind. We're alone. We're, we're, we're not with other people. We may not have the strength of other people to say, hey, that's a stupid thought. Let's turn this off. We've got to take responsibility for our thinking ourselves. Now, peace belongs to those who filter their thoughts through what God says is correct. Now, there's great thoughts and there's little thoughts. Um, but some little thoughts can turn into great big ones real quick. I always remember watching the documentary on, um, I think it was the uh, bad guy, a murderer called Ted Bundy, who, who turned into this just terrible 
terrible guy um, who just did so much harm to ladies. And, and it was just everything about his world turned into just an epitome of sickness. And now he was in death row and, and he, recu he, he, received accus he received execution for, for some of the things that he did. But I remember watching a videotape that he'd sent out. It was an interview with uh, Dr. Uh, Dobson. And it was something that he'd done not to get off of death penalty or anything, but to warn others. And I remember in that interview that Dr. Dobson said to Ted Bundy, who became this terrible serial killer, where did it all start? Where did the journey to you becoming this murderous, sick individual, where, where, where did it start? And Ted Bundy said, I can tell you exactly where it started. I was walking past a bin and somebody had left um, a pornography magazine in the bin. He said, and I took the pornography uh, magazine out of the bin. And that's where my journey of diminishing return began. I began to get appetites and then greater appetites. But he tracked it back to that one moment where he had a thought, shall I take that pornography out of the bin? That's a really scary um, analogy, isn't it? That huge things, um, not just negative, but positive, can come from singular thoughts. That's why as believers, followers of Jesus, spirit-filled people, we've got to be agreeing with Isaiah saying, yeah, I'm going to live in the perfect peace that comes from a mind that stayed on God. Agreeing with Peter. Now, I'm going to be a person that don't just, I'm not just going to let thoughts flash in and out ungoverned. I'm going to begin to, and this is preaching to me as well as, well as to you, I'm going to begin to be more conscious of the thoughts that I'm being exposed to and the thoughts that are coming into my mind. Like I said, some experts say the average person has over 6,000 unique thoughts in any given day. They can be good, they can be bad, they can be ugly. Um, another great analogy I've heard many times is um, concerning thoughts. It's, it compares it to birds. It says you can't stop the birds flying above your head, but you can stop the birds making a nest um, in your in your heart. And we're exposed daily to so many thoughts, especially in this um, ultra media driven world. And we can't sometimes control the thoughts that are going on around us, you know, overhearing conversations for me, listening to neighbours, arguing all manner of stuff that's going on. What's coming from media, what's coming from TV, what's coming from people I know, people I love, people I've never met. Thoughts, 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 thoughts. But I can say, you know what, I'm going to stay my mind on God and have certain filters in my life that say, no, that thought is not kingdom. That thought is, has got nothing to do with Jesus. That thought has got nothing to do with kingdom living. So I'm not letting that thought land or come in or make a nest in my life. Every one of us, because of the help of the Holy Spirit, have that ability. Of course, we can't talk about thought life and taking authority in thought life without looking at 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, where it encourages that we should be casting down vain imaginations. Now, imaginations, what are imaginations? They're thoughts. They're thoughts that have been an, um, allowed to go to the next level. An idea came, a singular thought came into the processor of your mind. You enabled it or allowed it to stay longer than what it should, and it began to form an imagination. You actually begin to picture yourself doing what the thought says you should or could. And again, this isn't just negative, it's positive. If you begin to get God thoughts of huge things and let them germinate and turn into imaginations, that's a good thing for you and for what God's given you to lead. But on the negative again, without trying to be too negative, people's imaginations are thoughts that are ungoverned or uncontrolled and allowed to go to the next level. Where the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, that we're to take every random, strange, rogue thought or imagination that exalts itself against the knowing of God or what God says is correct. And the Bible, you know, in different places, it alludes that we're to grab that and pull it down and make it captive, hold it captive. You know, um, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 says, casting down every vain imagination that would exalt itself <coughs> against the knowing of God or against kingdom living. Now, this is something that we don't do on Sunday morning for two hours. This is a regular in our life. We've got to be conscious of the thoughts that are trying to come in to the processor of the mind that God has given us. And it's a great thing. The mind is a blessing. God gave it to be a blessing. But we live in a fallen world. We live in a world where 
things are in a fallen state and the, the fallen thoughts of a fallen world want to invade your thinking space, your airspace. More than that, they want to germinate in your heart to create things that God hasn't got for you or, or doesn't desire for you. We need to, let me say it again, be the guardman at the door of our life saying this is coming in, this isn't coming in. And as we do that, then we maintain what Isaiah says we can know, which is the perfect peace. And it's a peace like Jesus says, that, that, of Jesus, that it passes all understanding. Now, again, garbage in, garbage out, garbage in, garbage out. Are you allowing any route for garbage to come into your thinking. If so, shut the door, lock the garage door, make sure that no garbage can be delivered so that you have a temptation to allow that garbage to come in. We've got to monitoring, be monitoring in our thoughts. So, so okay, here we go. We, we've been looking at the mind as a processor. What does it process? It processes thoughts, small and large. We're surrounded by thoughts every day. We've got to begin to take greater authority in a world that's so insecure to be saying, OK, no, no, it's my responsibility. It's not pastor's responsibility. It's not Pastor Stewart's, Pastor Steve, Pastor Jeff. It's not any of my pastor's responsibility, Pastor Paul, you know, Pastor Sandy, Pastor Charlie. It's not their responsibility to govern the thoughts that are coming in or being allowed in my life. It's my responsibility. I've got to take every rogue thought that would exalt itself against what God says is true and pull it down, make it captive, make it a prisoner to the things of God. Now, every great thing starts as a thought. And um, that's true of whether it's the greatest victory you've known or the greatest sin. Like I said, re referring to that, that gentleman, Ted Bundy, who actually became a Christian, I believe, received a deliverance in the last days of his life. Um, and though he was made innocent by God through repentance, he still went through the consequences of what the courts of the land required. But um, I believe that in those closing moments, the grace of God was there to bring him to repentance. But in that moment, he said that that terrible life that he lived, that horrendous life that had a terrible effect on others, all started with that singular thought. Now think with me for a moment, there's many examples that we could use, but David's a great one, isn't he? David had a thought, I can kill giants, and giants he killed. But David also had a thought, um, I should be with, uh, I, sh I should be, yeah, I, I should be with Bathsheba. And that thought brought incredible destruction into his life. So you've got this one incredible leader called David, the shepherd boy who became the king of Israel. And in one moment, he has a thought when every, everyone's saying, the, the giant can kill us, the giant can kill us, the giant can kill us. Suddenly David gets this heaven thought. Oh no, I can have this giant. I've beaten the lion and I've beaten the bear. I'm going to take this Goliath down as well. Who does he think he is? The uncircumcised Philistine. I'm going to have this giant. He doesn't stand a chance against me. So David went out on the battlefield, driven by a thought that was inspired by God. But then later on, we read about David that it was in a season when kings went out to war. Now, here's the problem. David was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Always be careful where you are. You see, the kings had gone out to war, yet David was still at home. If he'd been out in war, he wouldn't have been in that moment or that environment where a thought could come in that contained such destruction for him, the husband of the wife, and for the child that was the produce of that moment that was conceived. So we've got to understand that when you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, get out and get into the right place. Sometimes the thoughts that we can get can be from being in the wrong place. You know, uh, maybe the TV channel, you didn't turn it over. Listen, get back out to wall, turn the TV off, turn it over. Make sure that your life lives in an element of protection regarding what is fueling or sourcing or bringing to you the thoughts that your mind is going to process. So when we look at David we see this moment where David gets a thought of giant slaying brilliant we love that whoa well done David but then we get that moment where David's on a rooftop in a season when he should have been at war he's in a moment when he's vulnerable he's alone in a moment when he's vulnerable he looks over the wall and sees obviously a Bathsheba bathing and within him a thought comes I want her it was a very simple thought Remember, your mind, like we said, 
Um, the Bible says, gird up the loin of your mind because your mind can be procreative. It can be, it can conceive and produce incredible, incredible good or incredible bad thoughts. Now, so David looks at Bathsheba and says, I want her. There's the thought. What should he have done in hindsight? He should have said, that's a horrible thought. I'm God's king for the moment. I'm pulling that thought out. That thought is adulterous. That thought is murderous. But in his weakness, in his moment of vulnerability, he went to the next level and allowed that thought that had come into his processor to germinate within his heart. And suddenly the thought turned into desire, but desire turns into sin. Now, what he should have done if you would have interviewed him afterwards, he should have said, man, I should have dealt with that thought. I should have turned away and said, God, would you cleanse my mind of what I've sinned? You've got better things for me than being an adulterer and a murderer but he didn't and out of that single thought that single thought it was just like a seed among 6,000 other seeds that he was exposed to in that day like you and me germinated a moment where he slept with the lady but then um, then incubated another plan of how to kill her husband, sending him to the front line, really putting a knife in the back of one of his faithful men. And, and, you, and you know that no good thing came from that instance, that God's grace was there. And even as he buried the child that was the produce of that moment, um, Solomon was in his loins. So there's always a tomorrow for people that have made a mistake. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, oh, how he would have done differently with that thought if he could live that moment again come on you've done it I've done it we've all done stuff that we're embarrassed of we've all done stuff that we think oh, I'm, oh that was stupid you know one definition of sin is temporary insanity come on have you ever been there or is it just me don't leave me out there quiet have you ever done anything in the heat of a moment something stupid something bad and then afterwards just when the Holy Spirit began to go hello you went what an idiot what made me do that? Sin, temporary insanity that blinds your understanding or jams your processor so that a thought can come through that's got destruction in the DNA of it and not good, holy life and everything that God intends for you. So again, gird up the Lloyd of your mind. That's the word we're looking at together today. Let's be people that purpose in our hearts to gird up the loin of our mind. Let's realise that our our mind is a loin. It, it's, it's procreative. It's got the ability to create good good and bad. Now, now giving you bad examples of poor David and Bathsheba, but I can remember, you know, look at family church today, right? Family church today, what, we're 20, I don't know, what, about 23 years old, Stuart, correct me and give me the exact timing in a few moments down to the hours and the minutes. Expect that any second. Um, but a family church, you know, we've got different congregations. We've got congregations that are, um, are in the Philippines. We've got congregations here, uh, we've got food banks feeding people at the moment. We're, we've got boots on the ground in, in different sectors, missional sectors. We've got Guildford. We've got Gosport, Waterside. We're around Hampshire. We've got an effect in different things. We, you know, thank you, Jesus. Family Church has become this oak tree, but now we're even supporting a lot of other ministries that we're helping them to walk through, find their, their, their God spot and all that stuff. But where did it all begin? Where did it all begin? I'll tell you where it began. I was driving down a road. I even tell you the road, the M27, uh, on my way to Romsey or Southampton. I was driving down that and I can even tell you what car I was in. There you go. Stuart says 23 years old to church is almost to the day. Told you he'd be on that. The moment I sent out that thought, boy, his processor started going. And what a processor. Pastor Stuart's got his capacity always amazes me. So thankful for you, Stuart. Now, I'm driving down the road, just driving, do-do-do, got Gina in the car, Olivia's just been born, she's probably, be, I don't know, she, uh, just barely born. And all of a sudden, down the road, a seed comes in through the car window, not a seed from a field that I was driving past, a thought seed came in. Because every seed is like a thought, you see. It came in through the window, and the thought was this, um, you've been an evangelist, you are an evangelist, what if you opened a church in Portsmouth? And it wasn't a me thought. It wasn't like, oh, I need to open the church. No, it was a God thought. I want you to open a church in Portsmouth. I want you to. And, and I can remember the moment I was driving. I didn't say anything to Gina. I was just driving down the road and that thought landed in my mind. God wants me to open a church in Portsmouth. I was an evangelist. I wasn't looking for pastoring. I didn't want a pastor. But the thought came. And you know what I did that was good? I didn't flick that thought out. But I allowed it to go from my initial processing to deep thinking. I allowed that thought to germinate. Yeah, how many people could we affect through a church? 
how, how much could we strengthen what God's doing in the UK through a church? And suddenly I allowed that thought, and I'm just driving down the road, do, 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 do. Gina's totally unaware. And I allowed that thought to stay and I allowed it to germinate. Then all of a sudden when it had germinated and I knew it was God, then I started to say to Gina, we're meant to have a church. We're meant to open a church. I remember going to my mum and dad and going, I was just sitting there and they said, what are you thinking, Andy? I said, we need to open a church. We need to open it in October. And, uh, and what I was doing was living <coughs> or giving expression to a seed that had arrived. Now look at Family Church today. Praise God. I'm so grateful for all it's doing. But I want you to see it started as a seed. Always, you will always go in the direction of your most dominant thoughts. Now, again, we're on the knife edge of, of, of positive or negative, evil or good. Um, if you look at when you work with somebody that's a, uh, an, an addict, or I've worked with crack, addict, crack addicts in New York, I've worked with different addicts. In my own life, uh, I had to, by the power of the Holy Spirit, beat certain addictions that were in my life. And I know that with addiction, it's all about the thought and unless there's a renewal of the mind now again time doesn't allow but there's some great books on this and the bible itself endorses that we shouldn't be conformed to the pattern or or the thinking of this world but we should be renewed by you know we should be transformed by the renewing of our mind it's like we get the word of god and we treat it like a kitchen sink or a bathroom sink and we're constantly putting our head and our face and our mind into God's ways, into God's words. And as we do, the old thinking that we had is replaced. The old data that we lived by, the old data that the old owner of the computer entered in is deleted. And we're not left like, uh, but rather the new owner of the computer of our life then enters his data into uh, the hard drive of who we are, and we begin to then process the new information. That's what the renewal of the mind basically is in computer terminology. Our lives were taken from the kingdom of darkness, brought into the kingdom of the son of his love, Colossians 1.13. When we came into the kingdom, he didn't wipe our mind. Otherwise, we'd be walking around with no consciousness of who we are or even why we chose him. No, we bring our mind, our soul into the kingdom. We're saved, we're sanctified. But the thing is, there's a lot of old data still on the hard drive of who we are now we're not to allow that hard drive to retain that data rather we're to say no i'm delete 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 boy that could take a lifetime can't it going through the files of the thoughts that you allowed to come into your mind over the formative years before you met christ but we've got to have an ongoing commitment come on holy spirit come on holy spirit expose the wrong files expose the virus help me to delete 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 to pull down every vain imagination exalts itself against your knowing or kingdom life but let me not be like this vacant um, mindless person now let me renew my mind with your word and as I bring your data your data into my hard drive and into my processor then my life is transformed and then my life comes into the perfect peace that it's promised that I can know in Isaiah chapter 26 so OK, let's kind of look at bringing this in for a landing, shall we? You will always go in the direction of your most dominant thought. And that's the same for addiction. I've worked with addicts and I've worked with addiction in my own life. When the thought comes, I need a drink. If you don't bring that thought into subjection, it will germinate and you will end up in an off license. You will. Because your dominant thought, that which you're giving prominence to, will determine where your body goes in the direction of. Now, for a drug addict, that thought could be, I just need a fix. You will end up near a dealer. Uh, for somebody with pornography, you will end up watching something, even though you put in secret codes, you've written that. You will find a way to watch what you know you shouldn't watch, which destroys your soul. Because the problem is within your thought. We've got to be taking every thought captive 
and making it subject. Get on your knees. What does God think about you? If God doesn't agree with you, you're out of here. You know, a great tool for me when I'm, I'm battling things in my mind is praying in the Holy Spirit. Because when I pray in the Holy Spirit, I bypass my mind. In my Holy Spirit, there's no greed. There's no abuse. There's no vileness. It's just pure, 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 pure. So when you speak in the Holy Spirit, what you actually do is you connect with the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ then begins to remove error, even when you don't know what's going on. So be tongue speakers, all right? I'm going to give you five things ever so quickly to shut down today with, all right? Always have, remember, your, your, your dominant thought will determine your direction. That's not just true for an addict. It's true for all of us. Um, it, it, it's where you set your pursuit. That's why the Bible says, but we're to ever ascend the hill of the Lord and, and to know him more. Make your pursuit God. Make sure that the thoughts that you're accommodating or germinating are God pursuit thoughts. I want more of him, less of me, more of him, less of me, more than him. I don't want to make God into my image like the Israelites at the bottom of the hill. I want to be like Moses, ever ascending. Have thoughts that take you in a, a deeper direction with God. Set your mind on him and on things above. Okay, five things if you're making notes. Time's nearly gone. Number one, be in the word. Come on, not rocket science. Be in the word because the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword and it's able to divide between soul and spirit. If you're confused where the thoughts that you're thinking are coming from, expose them to the sword of God, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, which will clearly let you see which is coming from heaven and which is coming from hell. So be a person that's living in the word remember when you live in the word you've got your head in the sink of God you're renewing your mind which means your life will be transformed all right so come on this is not rocket science be listening to the Holy Spirit let your heart not be hardened or calloused um, you know, it's good for us always to say, Lord, Lord, let my heart not be callous. Let me not become so conditioned to the ways of this world and what this world says is normal. But I don't feel the sensitive leading of you saying this isn't right, Lord. Let my heart be uncalloused. Listen, a prayer like that, God will hear and work with instantly. So be a life that's living in the word. Have a life that's listening to the leading of the spirit. Um, gird up the Lord of your mind right now. Maybe you've had a sloppy mind. You've been letting everybody have some say so. No, no, no. Put some fences up. Put some fences up today. Say, listen, I'm going to gird up the loin of my mind. If it's not pure, if it's not holy, get that list up that Paul refers to. Whatever's pure, whatever good, whatever a good report, whatever's noble, whatever beautiful. Think on these things, which means anything that's not, get them out. Chuck them out of your mind. Be a bouncer at the door of your mind. Get out of here. You're not welcome. Don't ever come back again. Come on, begin to be proactive with the procreative vessel of guiding up your line. Your, the loin of your mind. Understand how productive your mind is. God made it to be productive. Use it for him, the kingdom, and the benefit of others. Um, watch for meditation of your heart. That's the germination of the thought that's come in. You know, I love that psalm that says, let the, the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O God. Remember that song by Boney M? Anyone out there old enough? Let the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart come on. These are great kingdom principles. Let the meditation of your heart be pleasing in the sight of God. What's the meditation of your heart? The thoughts that you've allowed to go to the next level. If a meditation of your heart is evil, begin to let the word of God replace the thoughts that have created that germination within you. Um, don't leave your mind in neutral. That's number four. So number one, be in the word, be in the spirit. Number two, gird up, set your mind on things above. Number three, watch the meditation of your heart. Um, number four, don't leave your mind in neutral. Listen, David's mind was in neutral when he had that moment with Be, uh, uh, Be, Be, Bathsheba. His mind was in neutral. His mind should have been in gear. It says when the kings were at war, David wasn't at war. His mind was in neutral, which meant the enemy was able to grab the gear stick of his life and stick it in reverse. When if his life had been in first, second, third, fourth, fifth or sixth these days with some cars that I've rented, he would have been going forwards. But because because his mind or his life was in a place of neutral, the enemy was able to take advantage in that moment and put him in reverse. So he went backwards instead of forwards. Make sure your mind is not in neutral. That's why the Bible warns us of overdoing stuff like alcohol, etc. It says that, you know, uh, don't be drunk with wine in which there's excess or or another translation says, don't be drunk with wine, which is the opening of a door to many evils. I remember reading that. And it 
so true, you know, when your mind is in neutral because of drink or drugs or, or just laziness, it's amazing that what can follow is an open door to thoughts that you wouldn't allow in your life if your mind wasn't in neutral. So friends, let's make sure that our minds, I ain't judging anyone today, this is stuff I've got to be disciplined with on a daily basis, you know. Make sure your life is not in neutral. You're in gear. You're moving forward. Your, your gear is ascend the hill of the Lord to know God and his ways more so that the enemy has no foothold to put you into a state of reverse that you begin to go backwards instead of forwards. All right. And number five, this is a key one, but I, I, I wish I had time to expand on, but the good news is I don't need to because I did a podcast last Friday. If you go to the podcasts and uh, go to uh, the spiritual leader, Andy Elms, put in podcast, the spiritual leader, you'll, you'll see a podcast from last Friday called Catch the Fox. Catch the Fox, where I did 30 minutes full on, boom, 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 on the danger of little foxes in your life. It says the little foxes come at, at the time of blossom to destroy the vineyard. It's amazing that it doesn't say the time of harvest, it says the time of blossom. You see, the little foxes, don't worry about the big ones, have them sorted, have them caught. But the Bible says, catch ye the little foxes that come in the time of blossom. Why? Because blossom always precedes harvest. You always get blossom before you get fruit. So the enemy sends little foxes into the vineyard of your life to gnaw away at the vine and because they're small they're sometimes unnoticed what a beautiful comparison of thoughts sometimes thoughts come so small they're hardly ever sin unless we're allowing the holy spirit and the light of god's word to shine his light on those deceptive little critters as they're coming into the vineyard of our life but i want to encourage you avoid the little foxes now this has many outworkings or or examples we could use of what little foxes are. If you watch last or watch, listen to last week's podcast, Catch the Fox on the Spiritual Leader, which is my podcast that goes out every Friday. And um, then you can, Gabby will probably put up the address for you of Linktree, which is our our um, online web thing that takes you to every direction podcast. So Gabby, just stick that up for us right now as well in these closing moments. Uh, because on that, you can see um the spiritual leader and i talk and i really dig into little foxes catch the little fox catch the little fox but i want to end today with the worst little fox that you can experience is the little fox that comes as a thought that carries an agenda of hell not heaven uh an agenda of destruction not blessing um we've got to be people who are wise to be watching the little foxes so that we can move from the season of blossom into the season of fruitfulness. All right, well, that's me kind of done now. Um, hope you've enjoyed today. This has been Talking Church. I will see you next Tuesday for Talking Church. And don't forget to listen to a couple of the podcasts. God bless. 